Did you know that a simple dose of caffeine could boost your running performance more than a $300 super shoe? But it isn't just as simple as drinking a coffee before you run. In fact, throughout this video, I will prove to you why 100% of you watching right now should avoid the general caffeine guidelines if your goal is to run faster. But I promise, by the end of this video, you will have a clear understanding on the proposed benefits of caffeine, a tailored strategy on how much to take, when to take it, and by which delivery methods such as coffee, gels, chews, if you want superior results. And as a bonus for you Run Smarter Scholars, I'll be sharing the biggest mistakes you could potentially encounter that could derail your entire race. Let's start with the benefits that will excite you the most. Caffeine has been shown to improve endurance by two to 4%. And this is seen in trained and untrained individuals. Compare this to the carbon plated vapor fly that is breaking records all across the world, which delivers a benefit of 3%. Even when considering the low end of 2%, when factoring in, say, the world's fastest half marathon times, this is the difference between coming in first place and 97th place. But in order to perform at your best with caffeine, it's important to learn what caffeine actually does to the body to get these benefits. The research covers a long list of physical and cognitive benefits, but let's go through the most important for you runners. It releases fat cells from the liver that can be used as a fuel source. This is David Hallard, an ultra runner, the founder of Caffeine Bullet, and the newest guest on the Run Smarter podcast. And he has just mentioned that caffeine can give you better access to fats as an energy source, which delays the burning of your carb storage, and therefore more fuel in the tank to be used later in the race. But we are only just getting started. It reduces the perception of pain and fatigue. So in your mind, it makes pain feel less. One of the fascinating things I've learned in preparation for this video was the role of a chemical called adenosine. The longer we stay awake or the more energy we use, the more this adenosine builds up in the body. Now your brain is filled with these adenosine receptors that this chemical combines to. And the more receptors this adenosine attaches to, the more tired we get. This is where caffeine comes in because it actually acts like a blocker. It attaches to these adenosine receptors, but instead of slowing you down, it just sits there and prevents adenosine from doing its job. So instead of feeling tired, your brain stays more awake and alert, which would obviously translate into better running performance. But this begs the question, what is the optimal dose of caffeine if you are looking for the best possible performance? The optimal dose, and there's been over 50 studies that have shown this, is between three and six milligrams of caffeine per kilo of body weight. When I looked through the literature, I read through similar suggestions. So if I weigh 70 kilograms and a standard can of Red Bull has 80 milligrams of caffeine, I would need to take two and a half Red Bulls at the low end. And if following the six milligram recommendation, I would have to consume five Red Bulls. And while this might seem over the top, remember, this is for your optimal performance. You're not going to take that for your interval session, your tempo run, or you know, anything that's not your absolute A race. However, if you want to utilize the benefits of caffeine in your training sessions, David mentioned you only need one milligram per kilogram of body weight or close to half a milligram per pound, which we all agree is a lot more manageable. But when we're talking about these high amounts of caffeine, it's not necessarily taken in one go before a race. That will become more clear when I start talking about the timing of caffeine. But while we're still on the subject of dosage, I don't feel like I've been very helpful giving you a massive range between three and six milligrams and having you figure out the rest. So what I thought might be helpful would be talking about caffeine tolerance. If you drink coffee or energy drinks daily, you likely have a caffeine tolerance. And research has shown that regular caffeine users amassing three milligrams per kilogram of body weight per day dampened the performance benefits when taking the same dose before exercise. However, when bumping up the dosages to six milligrams, the benefits then kicked in. So based on your relationship with caffeine, you can slide down the scale towards three milligrams or if your body has built up a caffeine tolerance, you can move closer towards the six milligrams, but test what best works for you. 
If you are a regular caffeine user and don't want to kick up to this higher dose, you can strategically remove caffeine and let the tolerance fall down to baseline, which as David mentions, will take a couple of weeks. You've got four days for it to leave your system, but it should take at least two weeks for, it, for some of those effects to reverse. Now, the right dosage means nothing unless you combine it with the optimal timing. And when you take caffeine, it works its way into the bloodstream and looks like this. Reaching a peak at around about 60 minutes with a three to four hour half-life on average. This means every three to four hours, the concentration of caffeine in your system will halve, which is why it might take several days for it to be completely out of your system. Most of the research recommends taking your caffeine 60 minutes before exercise. That way it hits its peak when you start. You might want this to be a higher dosage for shorter races like a 5K, but for longer events like a marathon, it makes sense to me to only have a slight buzz at the start line and to then be more strategic with your caffeine intake mid-race. You'd want to schedule in your caffeine to try and predict the time when you think you're going to start losing your pace. Sometimes it's 14 miles if you're, if you're not well trained, but typically if you're well trained, let's say 18 to 22. So the aim here is to have a peak concentration of caffeine in your system at the moment you think you will suffer the most. This does require a little bit of experience and foresight because like we mentioned earlier, peak concentration takes an hour on average. But this also depends on how caffeine is consumed. We can separate the delivery methods into two camps. The products that you have to swallow like coffee, gels and capsules, which then have to be absorbed through the gut in order to enter the bloodstream. Or we have caffeine chews or gum, which instead of taking one hour, take as little as 15 minutes to hit their peak. There's so many blood vessels under your tongue, in your mouth, down your throat. The act of chewing just gives the time and the exposure to all these membranes. As I mentioned earlier, David is the founder of Caffeine Bullet, which delivers caffeine chews at 30, 85 and 100 milligrams. And with their rapid absorption rate, they would be perfect as a mid-race option. They were generous enough to send me their products to try and also give you a 20% discount when using the link in the description of this video. So when it comes to various methods, a coffee 60 minutes beforehand or a chew 15 minutes beforehand are both acceptable. And then mid-race, a gel with adequate caffeine strength 60 minutes before hitting the wall or a chew 15 minutes before will help keep performance high. But if you are choosing the coffee option, make it at home and be as consistent as you can with the brewing process because caffeine concentrations can vary greatly. One cup of coffee has been shown to be up to three times the strength of another cup of coffee from the same chain for the same coffee. The soil, how much sunlight it gets, the humidity, how long it's roasted for, the pressure going through the coffee machine, all these things make a difference. So far, we have laid good groundwork on the dosage, timing, and delivery of caffeine. But up until now, we've been talking about caffeine recommendations based on the average responses across the whole population. But this is where it gets interesting and why I say that all of you shouldn't follow population averages. You see, people respond to caffeine differently based on their genetic profile. In fact, roughly 50% of the population are what we call super responders, while the other 50% don't have this effect. So when researchers conduct large studies and average everyone's results, those recommendations won't be ideal for you as an individual. Because depending on your DNA profile, you sit on one side or the other. No one sits in the middle. This is the genotype in question and is responsible for 95% of caffeine metabolism. It is split into three different types with the AA genotype considered fast metabolizers while AC and CC genotypes considered as slow metabolizers. Essentially, this means that if you have the AA genotype, you will absorb, process and remove caffeine from your system far quicker than the other two genotypes. And when looking at long distance events, it does seem there is some research that shows the AA type obtaining higher performance effects. However, 
It was largely limited to male studies and tested with cycling time trials. But I should point out, the research did find slow metabolizers still get a significant improvement in their cycling performance, just not as much as fast metabolizers. However, when I dug deeper, they mentioned the studies were largely conducted with athletes taking caffeine 60 minutes before exercise. So it might not be that slow responders don't get performance benefits, but they may just need a higher dose and to be taken 90 to 120 minutes before exercise. But how do we know what group we fall into? Well, the only real way to know for sure is by getting a DNA test, but I'll share my workaround in a second. I actually had my own DNA test done a few months ago, which was relatively inexpensive, about $100, and all it took was a cheek swab, sending it to the lab, and getting my results two weeks later. And surprisingly to me, I am a super responder. And I say surprisingly because I've never been drawn to caffeine, I've never drank tea or coffee or energy drinks, so I thought I'd just be naturally fine without caffeine. But after getting my reports back, I'm definitely going to be trying some caffeine chews in my training and races and see if I feel any different. This brings me to my recommendations if you don't want to fork out the money for a DNA test. You can take an educated guess by getting a general feel of your caffeine sensitivity, including how long it takes for the effects of caffeine to kick in, but also how long the effects last for. For example, through personal experiences, you might know that you can't have a coffee in the afternoon because it will disrupt your sleep, or you get jittery or nervous with small amounts of caffeine. This might increase the likelihood of you being a slow metabolizer. Conversely, you might trial taking caffeine 30 minutes before a 5K event and notice significant improvements in your performance early in the race, increasing the likelihood of you being a super responder. These trials are obviously inaccurate compared to a DNA test because we have to factor in the placebo effect, your current tolerance to caffeine, and a bunch of other factors. Even if you get a DNA test, trial and error is recommended because there are a lot of other factors that can influence caffeine metabolism, such as your gender, vegetable intake, the phase of your menstrual cycle, and the use of oral contraception. Now that you are up to date with the current research on caffeine, let's cover three mistakes you simply must avoid if you want to run faster. The first is to resist the urge to sprint out of the gate at the start of your race, especially in long distance events like a marathon. With the right caffeine dosage and the right timing, you'll be feeling a good buzz, which increases the odds of you starting out too fast. But this will lead to burnout really early and will be disastrous for your finish time. The second mistake is being too aggressive with your caffeine during your training, leading to disrupted sleep. Sleep is the best recovery tool we have, and if the quality drops, the risk of poor performance and injury increases. Also note that too much caffeine has other side effects, such as jitters and nausea. And after watching this video, if you've recognized that you have a high tolerance to caffeine and want a reset, this has its dangers as well. If you are a very heavy caffeine user, you may actually have worse sleep when you cut your caffeine. My advice would be only do that if you've got enough time to properly get it to clear your system without it impacting your sleep. The final mistake I also learned from David, and this is a really important one, please resist the temptation to ditch the carbs in the final leg of your race. And in order to avoid hitting the wall, you need to understand this particular phenomenon. Among the wonderful things caffeine does, it also elevates your insulin levels, which extracts the sugars out from the blood. So while you are buzzing with caffeine and feel strong enough without carbs, not only will you hit the wall because of no carbs, but it will also be amplified with a sugar crash. Speaking of hitting the wall, research says that 56% of us recreational runners will encounter hitting the wall in our next race, which will add 30 minutes to our finish time. What is the big factor that separates those that hit the wall from those who don't? Well, I explain it all in this video, including a wall prevention secret that pro runners are keeping to themselves. So click on it now and I'll see you there.